This is a $125 million investment of private capital into the Urban Center, and we are very excited about that. A new project planned for the Las Colinas Urban Center. Here why some are so eager to see Water Street open. We saw a bowling ball around here. Bowling balls, basketballs, tennis balls, golf balls, all sporting goods like that. Those are some of the odd things people have tried to recycle. We have others, plus the list of things that should always be recycled. Also, it's known as Irving's birth certificate. Find out where the city of Irving's oldest map is now located. Plus an update on the West Nile virus, why Geraldo Rivera was in Irving, and the celebration of Mexican Independence Day. This is City Source. With temperatures feeling more like fall, what is the outlook for the West Nile virus? Hello and welcome to City Source. I'm Thomas Gandy. That story is coming up, but we begin with the new development planned for Las Colinas. We heard from people who are excited to see the project called Water Street get started. The bank just get off struck by the view. The 26 floors up. Town. The view from La Cima Club at Williams Square is already impressive. The view's just going to get better. That is because of what is planned for this land down below. A project called Water Street, a combination of residential, restaurants, and shops. La Cima's membership director hopes it draws more people to the urban center. It is something that I think is going to be a big shot in the arm for the city of Irving and I think that it is something that everybody's going to be excited about. At a recent meeting, Irving City Council approved moving forward with the project and heard more about it from the developer, Gables Residential. The site really appeals to us because of its location. It's near the DART station, it's circulated by the APT line, it's near the hike and bike trail, and it's across from Williams Square. The city worked with Gables on amending the design. Several acres of green space have been added right in the middle. It would be available for programming, for a symphony in the park, for community events, for farmers markets. Visitors will also have new parking options. We're not calling it a parking lot, we're calling it, calling it a parking garden, right? Because it, there's an immense be. amount of landscaping yeah. on this parcel of property. <laughs> They've done all, all of the things that we've asked for and the thing that I'm especially excited about is not only bringing more restaurants to the area, because that's so important to our businesses and our residents, but also creating a green area for the urban center. The city helped get this land ready for development by reclaiming a portion of Lake Carolyn, providing more space for the project. That work was done a few years back when Water Street was first discussed, but those plans stalled. City leaders do not expect that to happen again, though they can understand why people ask the tough questions. I understand that they have to see it, so I think it's a good question. What, what makes them believe it? I think they're going to have to see it. For years and years, I always talk about the pretty pictures that we see without actually any development, and that's frustrated me as well when I was on the city council, when I was a resident, and when I was mayor. And the fact is that they have the financing. They're not asking the city to provide financing. This uh, group already has leases signed, which they didn't have it uh, last time. I think those are strong indicators of uh, production, you know, of, of actual results. The city of Irving's work in this area, including developing the Lake Carolyn Promenade, will complement the planned Water Street project. It was a small investment on our end, and we really were able to get a big project underway. I mean, over $100 million is, a, is huge for this area, and it really will help the valuation in, in our property taxes. Crews could break ground next year, and within a couple of years, diners could be enjoying a meal lakeside. We're finally taking advantage of the views that Lake Carolyn has to offer. We get compared to South Lake Town Center, to Legacy, to Mockingbird all the time. But the fact is, is that if you look at any other place in the Metroplex, we're the only ones who have a lake and lake dining. And we're really excited to be able to take advantage of it. La Cima is not worried about the competition. The club welcomes anything that will draw more people to the urban center when the workday ends. So the membership director looks forward to seeing construction from the windows. I think competition is good. I think one of the things about Las Colinas is that we have this um, business environment and there's not a lot of after hours and I think that's only going to enhance the after hours participation in the uh, Las Colinas area. So I don't look at it as competition at all, I look at it as, as an enhancement. The design of those buildings is meant to be complementary to William Square and other buildings in Las Colinas. Again, Gables wants to break ground 
in the spring. Development was also the main topic at this event at the Irving Convention Center. The Transit Coalition of North Texas presented sessions on how transit stations can become magnets for development. Of course, this is an important topic to Irving with the opening of the Orange Line. The city has already seen renewed interest in property around the stations. Mayor Beth Van Dyne welcomed the crowd of transportation experts and local leaders. City Manager Tommy Gonzalez participated in a panel on transit-oriented development projects. Our strategic plan that we did at the city really helped us focus on the development that I talked about here in the Urban Center and TODs. And we have a TOD in the south. And I think that now it's starting to take a shape and we've got some people interested in building some residential and bringing in some commercial. Another session focused on plans for the Cotton Belt rail system. One more transportation note, the opening of the Dart Orange Line means Irving residents have a new way to get to a yearly highlight for many, the State Fair of Texas. From any of the Orange Line stops in Irving, riders can transfer to the Green Line, which goes right to the fairgrounds. Day passes are $4 or buy a fare ticket dart combo at Kroger for a discount. Now to the latest on the West Nile virus. Nightly spraying is continuing in Irving and crews with the Parks Department are not stopping in their fight against mosquitoes. What this is is called a gravid trap. It uses a mosquito bait. All summer, mosquito control technician Thomas Dickens has been setting out traps across the city of Irving. I know the viewers can't tell, but it, it stinks bad. It yeah. smells like uh, stagnant water times 50. That nasty but natural concoction lures mosquitoes into these traps so they can be captured alive for testing. We'll be setting traps and uh, testing them probably till around the middle of November. As long as the state of Texas is still testing them for us, we'll be submitting them. This is my third season to do this, and this is by far the busiest that we have been. With temperatures dropping, the mosquito season seems to be past its peak. We've only had one positive trap in the last six weeks, so that's, that's, that's a really good thing. Throughout the summer, hundreds of people have called the city's mosquito hotline with questions. Many have concerns about how to protect their loved ones. This is a new issue for people around here to really be conscious of the fact that a mosquito can make you so sick they could kill you. Some residents have asked for traps to be set in their yards. Others report standing water. That's because mosquitoes breed in stagnant water. Dickens knows many of the places in city parks where water collects, so he treats those regularly. I just come over, pour a little bit in. It doesn't take a whole lot for this to be effective. The nightly spraying routine will likely wind down soon, but there is not an exact date. We're not looking for a time frame, we're just looking for conditions. If we start to see nights where we're dropping into the 40s. Typically the Culex mosquito kind of just disappears. They just go away for the season. As the temperatures start to drop a little bit, uh, you're going to start seeing fewer mosquitoes. Uh, you're also going to start seeing mosquitoes try to go inside the house. Um, they're trying to go to an area that has less wind. So fans are a good deterrent inside a home because mosquitoes don't like wind or cool air and uh, good old fashioned fly swatter will help every time. Even though activity is slowing down, the city's mosquito control team wants people to know they work year round. There's eggs that could be laid today that may not even hatch till April. So we are definitely looking for stagnant water all the time. It's pretty essential for a standing water like this to get it in the lowest spot. Their work continues and the best advice for residents remains to take precautions. Do whatever you possibly can to not get bit. A reminder that updated neighborhood spraying schedules and other advisories are updated at cityofirving.org. Also, reach the Mosquito Hotline at 972-721-3755. The participation rate in Irving's curbside recycling program is not as high as it could be. In some cases, that may be because people don't know how it works or what can go in the blue bags that are picked up curbside. So in this second part of our special City Source series, we're showing you what you can recycle. We do a lot of cakes and cookies and family recipes. Julie Cobley's kids like to help in the kitchen. This day, they're making banana pudding. It's a treat Keegan and Caitlin enjoy, and they generate almost no trash in the process of making it. 
all of the boxes and containers will be recycled. We really try very hard to constantly be aware of what can be recycled and what can't be recycled. Rinse it out. They know that they stack things here. The Cobblies participate in Irving's curbside recycling program. Julie got started after a relative told her about it. It didn't take any effort for her. And, and once I saw that, it was very, I just went home and I went, I'm going to check into Irving's program, see what it takes, and it, you know, again, took nothing. For the kids, it has become habit, just part of the home routine. He's only six, so, and he's really good about going, does this go in the blue or does this go in the white? And Keegan is not the only one with questions. Sometimes you have questions about what exactly can go in. For answers, we went straight to the plant that handles Irving's items, Green Star Recycling in Garland. We wanted to know whether some items could go through this complex sorting system that gets recyclables ready to be made into new products. We started with one of Julie's concerns. I've always heard don't put pizza boxes in because of the grease, so we don't do that. People have a lot of questions about recycling. One that comes up is food boxes, one that you might get whether you order a pizza. Yeah, exactly. A lot of these containers now that are coming post-consumer will have a little bit of organic um, residue in them. As long as the main issue, whether it be the pizza, the donuts, water, are out of the container, it's okay to go ahead and throw these in your recycling bin. Another one people want to know about phone books. You definitely, see the glue yeah. on the spine and everything and wonder, can it go on the line? It can go. Definitely recycle your phone books. Another thing we get around the house, items that have cardboard and plastic, such as this tissue box. You can go ahead and throw that in. Uh, this, once again, will come out in the pulp process at the mill, so not an issue. Jars. All of us have food jars in our kitchen, and this one, it doesn't look like even was even rinsed out. So is that a problem? Uh, it, it, it is a problem if it's full. The jar has a lot of organic substance in it. But if it's minimal like this, it's not a big issue. It comes through, it goes through the glass breaker screen, and then it's sorted out of the stream. Uh, then it goes to the glass plant where it's cleaned up. So small residue amounts, not an issue. Full residue um, is an issue. What about the lid? The lid will separate through the screen once it hits the crusher, the glass breaks the tin will go off on the magnet. So. so this can go on the line as is? As is. Back in the beginning of recycling programs, they wanted a little cleaner material stream to work with because the technology wasn't as advanced or evolved as it is now. Uh, now they've got technology and tools in the processing that can deal with most of those what would have been imperfections originally in the recycling programs. Labels don't need to be taken off, lids don't need to be taken out, a little bit of fluids left in a bottle isn't a big deal. Those advanced processes are also meaning there are more items that people can recycle, as we found out back on the processing line. This right here is a, a soup container, but a lot of us have juice cartons that are just like this that have the lining in there. Yeah, exactly. This is what we call an aseptic or a tetrapack container. And uh, we have the technology to capture this material now, uh, send it to mill, where they'll actually have the, the technologies there to separate this. It's a brand new material that we've added to the recycling program. Our processor can now handle them. They've got a brand new market for them. We're excited to be able to offer that. That's just one more material that doesn't have to go to a landfill. So what I'm hearing from you is really a lot of things are recyclable that maybe people don't realize are. Nine times out of ten, if you're buying it post-consumer, we can recycle it. But that does not mean just put everything in your blue bag. Certainly, there are places Mickey Mouse would rather be. In fact, all around, there are reminders of some of the odd things that people have tried to recycle. First thing that comes to mind is a prosthetic leg. We saw a bowling ball around here. Bowling balls, basketballs, tennis balls, golf balls, all sporting goods like that. It's not just annoying. This piece of metal could hurt someone here. The problem is this gets into a stream and then it becomes detrimental to the employees, get kicked out of the stream and become a hazard. And it looks like party streamers, but it's actually videotape that has jammed up sorting machines. That tape will wrap around a bearing and it's just like sandpaper. It's a similar problem with plastic shopping bags. They wrap around screens, causing loads to become contaminated. By virtue of doing that, they generally don't end up being recycled. That's why at just about every step in the process, crews keep a close eye out for any foreign items. The cleaner um, that, that comes into the plant, the better it is for the company, the better it is for the municipalities that we share the rebates with. They'll have a bag full of recycle, but then they'll dump a plate of food in there, which contaminates you know most of that recycle anyway. Irving Solid Waste Services crew members also see the mistakes people make. 
Occasionally we'll see a blue bag that's full of grass clippings and while you can compost your grass clippings, that's not a program that we offer to our residents and we can't recycle those materials obviously through our curbside program. So what does go in your blue bags? Most everything that you have that is a container at your home is recyclable, whether it be plastic, paperboard, cardboard, aluminum, steel. Along with those aluminum and steel cans, aerosol cans, plastics coated one through seven with the exception of styrofoam, all kinds of paper and cardboard are accepted. That is a lot of material that can go in the blue bags. You know, you just get them at the rec center. And Julie Cobley sees the difference it makes in her home. Before we really started years ago, you know, I had a lot of trash, but now it seems like I, I, I have one bag of trash a week, maybe two, depending on if we have, you know, family over and stuff. But, and I always have one really big bag of recycle and sometimes more than that. So, um, it, yes, it does make a difference. She has even taken it a step further, keeping recycling in mind when she shops. You know, the yogurts, these items, the steel cans, the plastic now for the fruit. When we buy eggs, I buy them in cardboard cartons so that I can recycle the cardboard. You want to put some more cookies on top now? It has all become second nature for the Cobley family, and they appreciate the city giving them an easy way to make a positive environmental difference. I think Irving does a great job with their recycle program. Now you heard the plant manager mention there that plastic shopping bags are not recyclable, but many major grocery stores have places you can drop off bags right at the entrance. Next time on City Source, we'll wrap up our look at recycling with a few notes on how apartment residents can recycle and what you can do with old electronics. Irving police have long partnered with neighborhood associations to participate in the National Night Out Against Crime. And again this year, officers will fan out across the city to participate with groups and promote safe neighborhoods. In addition to those gatherings, there will be a large National Night Out event in the parking lot at Kroger on North Beltline Road. Police have been targeting the area around Beltline Road and Northgate Drive with a special crime-fighting initiative. And this will be a chance to celebrate the progress so far. A lot of police equipment and other exhibits will be there for people to learn from and enjoy. National Night Out is Tuesday, October 2nd at 6 p.m. at Kroger on Beltline Road. Residents have a new way to learn about the history of Irving. An exhibit was just unveiled at the Central Library, and City Source reporter Ashley Roberts was there to learn more about it. <laughs> This is a map that holds great significance. What this shows is that there is a rich history of our city. A rich history that dates back 109 years ago, the very beginning of Irving. This is the birth certificate of that city. Recently unveiled and showcased here at Central Library, this is the city's original plat map. I'm proud of the unveiling, but I tell you the truth, I think I'm most proud of all the people that showed up. It is a treasured item for lifelong Irving resident Charles well, Brown. Otis Brown and my granddad and J.O. Schultz had bought a little over 80 acres and started subdividing it and drawing this plat up. For Irving co-founders Otis Brown and J.O. Schultz, it was strictly a business venture. That would utilize during the auction of December the 19th, 1903, to sell tan lots to the brand spanking new city of Irving. One of the first plots purchased was by State Representative Linda Harper Brown's grandfather, Ike Story. This is a great day for Irving and an opportunity now for everyone to get a, a really good understanding of how our city started. Uh, this is special as we unveil uh, the original 1903 town plat map. It is also a meaningful piece of history for the Irving Heritage Society, an organization always working hard to preserve the city's history. You know, there's a lot of excitement uh, about restoring this and to proudly display it where the citizens of Irving can enjoy it. Members of the Irving Heritage Society and the Brown family hope that when people walk through the doors of the Central Library, they'll notice this map and become more inquisitive about Irving's history. I want people to come by and understand what this is, what it means, that it really is the birth certificate of this city. 
That is Brown's first hope for the new location of the map. His second? I want it to be a linchpin in a new heritage museum that I hope goes into this building. And the map is right next to the Irving Archives Office, giving the public endless opportunity to learn about Irving's evolution. And what a good opportunity for children, for school children, and for other uh, people that live here in Irving to come and see some of the history of our great city. Uh, youth, kids today, 25, 50, 75, 100 years from now, can look at this information, look at this town plat, and just like we're doing today, 109 years ago, on where, where it all started. And to keep the map preserved forever, it will be taken down and rested for three months every two to three years. Precaution was also taken to keep it from sagging. That map was stitched onto a backing, uh, I think it was a cotton backing, with thousands of stitches of silk thread. All in an effort to share Irving's rich history with its residents. And uh, I bet a lot of cities cannot say that. Uh, it's lost, it's stored somewhere, but uh, it's important to Irving and the Irving Heritage Society to uh, restore this. A single unveiling ceremony leading to an infinite celebration of Irving's birth. Ashley Roberts for City Source. Still to come here on City Source, the celebration for Mexican Independence Day. But first, Web Watch, our most popular and most talked about videos online. People are rediscovering a video we posted a few months ago on hand cycling. Paralympic medalist Oz Sanchez inspired local riders. A fit body is a fit mind, and a fit mind is, uh, usually ends up in a happy individual. Even though the summer is over, people apparently want to be reminded of their memories at the West Irving Aquatic Center. Our most recent story we did there got a lot of new views. Also catching on, the first part of our series on the City of Irving's recycling program. If you missed any of those stories, links to our ICTN On Demand site and our live streaming 24-7 coverage are available at ICTN.TV. Also, catch us at YouTube.com slash The City of Irving. After you watch a video, type a comment to let us know what you think. We may read it right here on WebWatch. The Irving Convention Center continues to attract a diverse range of events, and we have several to show you. We begin with the celebration of Mexican Independence Day. Again, here's Ashley. This party honors culture and celebrates freedom. This is the uh, DSSA celebration, the celebration of Mexico's independence. On September 16, 1810, Mexico claimed its independence. Well, as you can see, we have a big party just to celebrate. It's part of our heritage, it's part of our country. For 202 years, Mexicans have celebrated this special occasion. I mean, it's, it's just a really great culture, and more people should, should learn a little bit more about um, Mexico, and, and especially because Texas has um, a lot of Hispanic culture. This year, the Mexican consulate is proudly hosting its Independence Day at the Irving Convention Center. So it's a really beautiful event. They brought a lot of talent in and entertainers in from Mexico to really give a, a real taste of the culture. There are also local performers, including Gabby Arguata and her mariachi band from Fort Worth, La Grandalla and Fantine a la Gran Plaza. This is a really big deal because you know, we practiced two months before, and whenever this comes up, we look forward to it. Arguata says the audience enjoys their performances. They look forward to us because they don't see many kids our age up there, and they feel proud that we're inheriting their traditions. A special appearance from Azteca 55 on-air personality Priscilla Sanchez, who flew in from Monterey, Mexico, also proved popular. I'm on the news. I'm a TV anchor, I'm the weather girl, and it's a pleasure to come here. Like many people here, Sanchez says she is a proud Mexican. This is a, a way to uh, loud the, celebrate, celebrate the, the Independence Day with the people who is not in their country, but they miss, miss Mexico. El estado de Tamaulipas. Around every corner is a little piece of Mexican culture. From the music and performers. We're a big fan of mariachi and our family. We, uh, we go sometimes do karaoke at like different uh, Spanish or Mexican restaurants. To a bit of picture taking fun. 
and good eating. We're doing some special things at our concession stands to make sure that we've got some culturally right foods for the celebration as well. But the festivities are not to be confused with Cinco de Mayo. It's a huge difference. Uh, the Independence Day is when we became a free nation. Cinco de Mayo honors a different historic event. The French army, they tried to, to invade our country and well, we won that battle and that's, that's Cinco de Mayo. This is something very different. Two very different celebrations that many Mexicans hope Americans understand. September 16 is our Independence Day. It's not, it's not Cinco de Mayo. And you know, we, uh, we have great food and you know, we're great people. Those who have lived or visited in Mexico say this anniversary has more significance. It was very different, but it was really fun knowing where you come from. So I kind of understand a little bit more, you know, the culture as to like whenever I used to live here and you know, I'm, we would go to Mexico like off and on. Many Mexicans here hope to pass on their country's rich traditions and historic pride to future generations. My parents have always taught us to kind of don't forget where we come from and our culture. And the Irving Convention and Visitors Bureau looks forward to embracing the next cultural event here at the Convention Center. It is a home away from home. This is kind of the living room of the community, so we want to welcome everybody in. Simply put in Espanol. Bienvenidos a la sala. Ashley Roberts for City Source. There were some somber moments at the convention center on September 11th. Irving police and firefighters were part of the observance, and several speakers at the America's Future event reflected on the attacks on our country 11 years ago. But the primary purpose of this gathering was to raise funds for the Big Brothers Big Sisters program. It's an organization that steps up in a time of need and puts a caring man or a caring woman in the life of a little one who's lost somebody or doesn't have that support that they need. Money raised at this event goes to the T. Boone Pickens Military Mentors Program and the businessman himself was there to share his thoughts on the need for a national energy program. Of course another big economic issue is employment and thousands of job seekers turned out at this putting Texans back to work job fair at the convention center. Cumulus Radio hosted the event, which attracted dozens of potential employers who were ready to talk with job seekers. I've come to get a job, you know, I need, I need employment. Right now I'm receiving unemployment and I need a job, something that's going to help me and my family, something that not just a really penny, any kind of job, I need some job that's going to help benefit me and my family. I've been saying that right from the get-go. And, and look who we spotted at that job fair, Geraldo Rivera. He hosted his talk show live from the convention center. Here's one employer that has most certainly been hiring. Fish City Grill is celebrating its opening. The Chamber of Commerce held a ribbon cutting for the new business, and a lot of people showed up and tried out some of the food. The city of Irving actually have been marvelous to work with. Um, some of the things that we were able to get in here is a blade sign out there. Uh, they allowed us to do that, which is an old nostalgic sign that looks absolutely incredible and really helped the whole center out, we believe. Uh, but they were very gracious in going through our plans and working with us. We found them extremely uh, easy to work with. I'm very excited to be a part of the city of Irving. Uh, any, any interaction I've had with the chamber or with um, the city of Irving has been such a delight. Uh, they've, they've welcomed us with open arms. They've answered all my questions. They've, they've provided us with a great city, one of the top 50 cities in, the, um, in, the, in, the, in America. And um, I feel like with it being in the middle of, of Dallas-Fort Worth, uh, that we, we have a great opportunity to be a big success here. Fish City Grill is located near the intersection of Interstate 635 and MacArthur Boulevard. A big welcome to our new viewers watching us on AT&T UVerse. All three channels of ICTN programming are now available on the cable system. This was an addition brought about directly because subscribers asked to be able to watch ICTN programming. We are glad to know you are asking for us. If you're a UVerse subscriber, you found us by going to channel 99. It's time now for our Pets of the Week, so let's head out to the Animal Care Campus.
Hi, I'm Laura Holmes, bringing you the pet of the week from the City Animal Services. This is Pearl, she's up for adoption. She is about a year old, very, very sweet cat, loves to play, is really active. <laughs> uh, this is Lila, she's about a year and a half old and she's a domestic short hair. She's available here at the center and she'd like, to, she'd like for you to come see her. Hi, this is Pete. He's a Lhasa Apso in a Shih Tzu mix. He is available for adoption starting today. He's about two and a half years old and would love for you to come meet him. This is Leah. She's about three to four months old. Very friendly. She's up for adoption. She would like for you to come see her. Thanks for watching. We have a lot of dogs and cats available for adoption here at the Animal Care Campus and we'd love for you to come out and see us. Thanks a lot. The Animal Care Campus is located at 4140 Valley View Lane. It is open Tuesday through Friday from 11 a.m. until 6 p.m. Then on Saturday, the hours are 10 a.m. until 5 p.m. Here's another way to help the Animal Care Campus. The DFW Humane Society's Black Collar Affair is coming up. Tickets are on sale now for the event that includes dinner, games, auctions, and even a doggy kissing booth. This is video from last year, but this time around it's in a new location and includes some daytime activities. The Black Collar Affair is Saturday, October 27th at 6 p.m. at the Las Colinas Country Club. Buy tickets at dfwhumane.com. Earlier in the day, there will be a poolside costume contest and pet parade, along with sketch artists and more. That starts at 10 a.m. Again, it's all on October 27th at the Las Colinas Country Club. A huge charity event is taking place in Irving for the first time. On the next City Source, see the turnout for the Lone Star Ride Fighting AIDS. Also, here are some of the other stories we are planning to bring you. See the volunteer effort making a difference on a local waterway. And we continue our look at recycling by showing you how apartment residents can get involved. Don't forget to interact with us. Like the City of Irving on Facebook. Subscribe to our channel at youtube.com slash the City of Irving. Or you can always email us at ictn at cityofirving.org. We'll read some of your comments right here on the show. And that's it for this edition of City Source. We leave you now with more of the celebration of Mexican Independence Day at the Irving Convention Center. Thanks to everyone who was a part of this one, and thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.